Ma'am, so we have started the broadcast. We can start now. Okay. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, all the panelists, the moderator, uh, to our joint WHO IAPH, uh, which is Indian Institute of Public Health, Gandhi Nagar. Uh, joint webinar uh, series uh, today uh, that's uh, on promoting health throughout the life course during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, today is our seventh webinar and we are almost uh, out of 11. We have done uh, a lot of webinars and uh, for aging this is our second webinar uh, in the series. Uh, I would like to first of all uh, welcome our panelists, uh, uh, Ms. Caitlin Littleton. Uh, Kathleen is uh, from uh, HelpAge uh, uh, India, uh, and she is, uh, uh, you know, a, a person, the known authority on uh, long-term care. Uh, so we uh, we are very fortunate to have you, uh, Ms. Kathleen, uh, on the team, and she'll be talking about residential and long-term care facilities, and what are the strategies to ensure safety and dignity of older people. I would also like to welcome uh, Dr. Sushma Bhatnagar. Dr. Sushma Bhatnagar is from, uh, she's a professor and head of the Onco Anesthesia, Pain and Palliative Medicine uh, from All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, and she'll be uh, telling us about stress of caring the terminally ill during COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that's something which is from the provider's point of view, she'll be sharing some of the experiences. I'd like to also welcome my colleague, Dr. Zi Han. Uh, she's a medical officer, aging and health unit, long-term care, Department of Maternal, Newborn, Child, Adolescent Health and Aging uh, in WHO Geneva, our headquarters. So uh, she'll be talking about preventing and managing COVID-19 across uh, long-term care services and what is uh, WHO's guidance on it. Uh, as we all know that uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has affected all of us, uh, you know, very dearly. You know, it is uh, something which uh, has given us a lot of challenges. Uh, it has also taught us a lot of resilience. Uh, it has also taught us how to, uh, you know, stay uh, at home, which many of us, especially the younger people, were not so used to. Uh, but then we have seen that this pandemic has affected the older people uh, a lot in terms of infection rate and in terms of uh, uh, mortality, it is much higher amongst older people. Uh, there are older people who are, uh, age is, we always say age is a number. So uh, to say that, uh, and many of us, I think, uh, who are connected uh, today are above 16. Uh, so, including me. Uh, so, this webinar is very, very close to my heart uh, because uh, as you grow old, although we say age is a number, but then we know that our parents, our uh, in-laws, uh, our near and dear ones, we have, so one time or the other, have really been engaged uh, in providing long-term care, either at facility level or at home. And uh, a lot at home, I think, uh, uh, which really uh, tells us, gives us a good enough experience on uh, uh, taking care of uh, older people. And now with the, uh, you know, uh, life expectancy going up, we see that more and more uh, older people, it's the older people who are taking care of older people. So the son or the daughter must be 60 or 65 and above who will be looking after uh, an elderly at home who's 80 or 90 or plus. So I think uh, there are challenges, and especially during COVID times, a disruption in services, access to care, uh, and uh, especially uh, looking after these people at home, uh, especially uh, long-term care scenarios, things are uh, very, very tough. So I think uh, we'll get a little deeper dive into the long-term care of older people uh, today during uh, COVID-19. And with these uh, words, I'd like to also welcome our 
a moderator, uh, Dr. Arvind Mathur, who is uh, a well-known uh, uh, specialist in uh, aging. Uh, he's the director of Asian Center for Medical Education Research and Innovation and editor of Journal of Indian Academy of Geriatrics uh, from India. Uh, Dr. Arvind Mathur will be coordinating this uh, webinar today. Uh, I would be uh, failing in my duty if I don't uh, mention about Professor Dilip Kumar. Professor Dilip Kumar has, uh, uh, is the director of Indian Institute of Public Health, Gandhi Nagar. And uh, the, these webinar series are uh, our collaborative work professor, with Professor Dilip Kumar and uh, his team who has really organized these webinars uh, very well. Uh, we have some more which will be coming up uh, on aging. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, you uh, must be seeing the series uh, of webinars uh, on which, which has been the flyer, which has been shared with you. Uh, we'll be, uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, this uh, older people, again, managing access to essential services to older people uh, on 21st October. Uh, so stay tuned every Wednesday to our webinars, which is our collaborative effort with IAPH, uh, Gandhi Nagar and WHO Cero. Uh, you know, I'm the senior advisor, I'm Nina Raina. I'm the senior advisor for maternal, newborn, child, adolescent health and healthy aging uh, in, and also violence against women in WHO regional office for Southeast Asia. So stay tuned. Uh, and this is not the end of our webinar series. We'll be coming up uh, soon uh, in collaboration with UNFPA, uh, UNICEF and UNESCO uh, series on uh, uh, school opening. So it's, uh, you know, as you see, it's a life course, uh, which we say from pediatrics to geriatrics. So we have a range of uh, uh, webinars which uh, interest our uh, different groups of people. So we will be, uh, uh, you know, coming up with uh, four or five additional webinars. Uh, on uh, school reopening and how countries and getting some countries uh, successful experiences uh, because uh, uh, on one hand you have a challenge of making sure that your older people at home are protected from infection COVID-19 infection on the other hand you have a challenge of how do you keep your youngsters at home and don't let them go out and bring the infection uh, to the older people and how to really keep them engaged and especially with schools closed, I think it's, it's becoming so very difficult. So, I, you know, we see uh, this as a, a holistic effort and a collective effort. And we see this as a life course and a family, uh, you know, looking after all. So today uh, we'll be uh, talking about uh, long-term care of older people during COVID-19. And we have wonderful experts with us and an excellent moderator. And I would now hand it over to Professor Dilip Mavlankar, our collaborator uh, in this whole webinar series uh, to really uh, tell us a little more about IAPH. And uh, then we move on to, uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Arvind Mathur to take us through. Over to you, uh, Professor Dilip Kumar. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nina Raina. Uh, it is always a pleasure uh, to be part of this webinar series. We are very delighted that WHO and IIPH Gandhinagar uh, is collaborating on this series of webinars. Uh, Indian Institute of Public Health Gandhinagar is the first public health university of India. It is an institute of public health offering master's level courses in public health, hospital management and industrial health diploma and certificate courses. Uh, we are a joint effort of the state government of Gujarat and the Public Health Foundation of India. And last few years, we have also now started work on training of uh, uh, assistants to provide care for old age people at home or in institutions. And that's why we are keenly looking forward to this webinar. Uh, as we saw the news from Western countries that a lot of cases and deaths happened in the old age homes in, India, uh, in the Western countries, 
uh, we were very curious as epidemiologists to see what is happening to old age homes. So we made some informal inquiries in old age homes in Gujarat and to our surprise, we found that none of the old age homes had any cases of COVID and the managers there had taken uh, various measures to protect the people in the old age homes. And uh, interested by this, now we are doing a more systematic uh, survey we, uh, of old age homes in Gujarat, Maharashtra and Rajasthan, wherever we have contacts. And what is uh, still surprising is that we have surveyed about 32 uh, old age homes with more than 950 old people staying there but only one case has been reported so far and no death has been reported we are still continuing our study and we would be very interested to understand what is the perspective in other states and other countries and why we are seeing this different pattern in india uh, as compared to the other countries with that short introduction let me again thank who and dr nina raina and uh, let us listen to this uh, very interesting webinar with galaxy of speakers who have long uh, interest and experience in this topic. Thank you very much, Dr. Nina. Thank you, Professor Dilip Mavlanka for a wonderful uh, insight into a new, you know, uh, I would say, uh, issue that why uh, in our part of the world, uh, old age homes are so protected. Uh, and I think primarily because the people who are staying in old age homes are not very mobile. They don't go out and people who are looking after them probably, I think, uh, are, are less in number or uh, have not been mobile. So we need to really look into the factors, uh, uh, what protects them uh, from really getting not uh, infected. But this is a very good and encouraging, uh, you know, finding. Uh, that old age homes uh, in some parts of India are protected and will be very interested in taking forward. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I move on to, now I hand it over uh, to uh, Dr. Arvind Mathur, uh, who is the moderator for this uh, webinar to really uh, take us through and invite the speakers. Uh, kindly write your questions in the uh, question answer or chat box so that we can take it at the end of the Dr. Mathur will be able to take it at the end of the uh, presentations. Over to you, Dr. Mathur. Thank you, Dr. Rena. Thank you very much for organizing very relevant and timely webinar on long-term care. Tomorrow being the International Day for Older Adults, this webinar is in, on time. And long-term care remains a major pillar for healthy aging. The task which we are trying to undertake in coming decade to achieve healthy aging, long-term pillar, long-term care is an important pillar. In COVID-19, we have seen a lot of problems to the older adults due to uh, the effect which it caused in long-term care facilities or so. The issue is that the older adults are more susceptible to the infection and also they show a severe form of infection with increased mortality, which has been shown uh, during this pandemic. There are multiple issues for the older adults when we talk of COVID-19. What is happening that their understanding and compliance of public health and preventive measures is also different than the, the younger adults. And that is call, also causing a problem with the lack of access to care, the food or other services, and also social isolation is also causing concern for them. So in this context, since the COVID-19 has posed an important challenge to long-term care, we are here to discuss this important entity. And today with our distinguished panelist, I'll begin with requesting Dr. Jia Han to talk about what has been the uh, strategy of WHO, because WHO has thought that not to miss this opportunity as an, uh, of this great crisis to turn into an, an opportunity. This, they have started working on uh, getting guidance for the long-term care facilities or so. So over to you, Jia. Thank you very much, Dr. Mathur. Uh, 
wonderful to be uh, present in this very meaningful webinar uh, and look very much forward to the October 21st uh, on essential services as well. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mathur. So if I were to continue with my, pre uh, should I continue with my presentation? Mm. Yeah, please, please you could begin with your presentation. Please. Sure, thank you very much. So, thank you. Um, thank you, as, you uh, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected older people disproportionately, especially those living in long-term care facilities. But before beginning, I'm sure everybody knows, just wanted to introduce briefly uh, the definitions that WHO uses for long-term care as well as long-term care facilities. For long-term care, as we all know, there are they are services uh, to ensure that people with risk of or at risk or of significant loss of physical and mental capacity can maintain a level of functionality so that they can do the meaningful things that are uh, in their lives as long as possible. Long-term care facilities vary by country, as we all know. Nursing home, old age homes, skilled nursing facilities are all collectively known as long-term care facilities, but here we use the term uh, and does not include home-based long-term care or community centers. So mainly uh, residential uh, facilities is what we use to define long-term care facilities. Next, please. So today I'll be uh, presenting key findings from a systematic review we did, a uh, brief introduction of the WHO IPC guidance for long-term care facilities, and a brief introduction of a policy brief that we uh, we released in July uh, of preventing and managing COVID-19 across long-term care services. Next, please. Next. Uh, yes, uh, data shows that as persons get older, there is a risk, increased risk of death. As we know, uh, the case fatality ratios uh, uh, over uh, beginning from 45 have increases exponentially as we age. Next, please. Uh, and if, if we see a little more in detail, uh, from age 45, uh, the case fatality ratio increases and older people are at higher risk of experiencing adverse outcomes from COVID-19 than any other population group. Next, please. If we look at data from long-term care facilities, we can also see that more than 40% of COVID-19 deaths were attributable to long-term care facilities. So in many, uh, especially high-income countries, uh, the drivers of uh, COVID-19 burden has been uh, linked to long-term care facilities. Next, please. So what are the key questions that we need to answer to better inform a, a, a better response? Uh, we need to know how many residents and staff members of long-term care facilities have, have contracted COVID-19, have contracted severe COVID-19, and have died due to COVID-19. Also, which infection prevention control strat strategies are effective in forestalling the spread of COVID-19 in long-term care facilities? Uh, it's really interesting that there may be cultural differences as well on how we organize and how we manage long-term facilities country by country. And I think India's case will be a very interesting uh, example for many other countries worldwide. Next, please. So to answer these questions, we did a, a live systematic review of emerging service, of emerging evidence, and we identified literature searches through systematic review of seven electronic databases. Next, please. And we found out about five key aspects. The first aspect we found out was that the impact of COVID-19 in long-term care facilities is distinct from the global from the general population. The extent of COVID-19 infection rates in long-term care facilities has varied widely. Outbreak investigations in long-term care facilities have found COVID-19 incidence rates as high as 71.7% among residents and as high as 64% among staff. Also, the case fatality for long-term care residents showed that they may be higher than the population of the same age outside of long-term care facilities. So for uh, an example in Canada, the incidence rate of COVID-19 deaths among residents of long-term care facilities was 13 times higher compared to community dwelling cases aged 70 years and over. Also in uh, Israeli nursing home, the risk for severe disease, including death, was 2.5 times higher with COVID-19 uh, uh, for, uh, for Israeli nursing home residents with COVID-19 compared to other cases over 65 years of age. So it really shows that there's something different uh, 
and things are being diff are different within long-term care facilities. Next, please. And also mentioned, we found that mortality related to COVID-19 is very high in, in, lo in long-term care facilities. Two countries reported that over 80% of all COVID-19 deaths were were among those within long-term care facilities. And out of uh, 11 countries, we saw that more than 50% of all deaths were from long linked to long-term care facility residents. Next, please. And also, it is difficult to control transmission once infection enters these facilities. It's mainly because strategies to contain COVID-19 in the general population may not be feasible to implement in long-term care facilities. As we all know, during the early phases of the pandemic, there was an under-prioritization of PPE provision, testing, and medical support. And we've also realized architecturally, it's very difficult to implement IPC, such as isolation measures, creating isolation wards within long-term care facilities. Also, the services that require care also require close proximity. And when there is an under-prioritization of PP provision to these facilities, the transmission rate starts to rise and soar. Also, we mentioned uh, in India, maybe the staff work may stay in the same facility, but uh, for many of the other countries, staff worked in multiple locations, transmitting and carrying infection from one facility to the next. Also, the residents have high susceptibility to severe COVID-19 due to old age and multimorbidity, and, asympt and there's a high prevalence of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic cases that we see in long-term care facilities. Uh, from the Lancet publication in July, we uh, a systematic nationwide testing of residents and staff of long-term care facilities in Belgium uh, showed that as high as 74.8% of residents and 74% of staff were asymptomatic at the time of testing. However, these are consistent results from other uh, literature we have found in, during our systematic review. So very high number of atypical symptoms, but very high number of asymptomatic symptoms uh, of cases within long-term care facilities. Next, please. We also found that there was a severe lack of active surveillance systems in long-term care facilities, which hampered immediate response. Very few countries report on the number of long-term care facilities, public and privately funded, number of people residing in long-term care facilities, number of resident staff who are positive, number of deaths related to COVID-19 that are linked to long-term care facilities. Uh, also, there are very few studies looking at transmission in long-term care facilities and the effectiveness of IPC and testing strategies in forestalling the spread of COVID-19 within facilities. Next, please. However, we also found that there are ways to mitigate. COVID-19 infection, if present in long-term care facilities, can be controlled if immediate action is taken. Uh, we look at a case from the Republic of Korea in a long-term care hospital where an infective caseworker was working for two days while symptomatic. After aggressive active surveillance, contact tracing, and, contact tracing and extensive testing of the residents and staff, there were result in zero additional cases in facility. Next, please. So, so we know that IPC is very important for long-term care uh, facilities in the, uh, for COVID-19. And in March, we uh, WHO uh, pro provided a guidance on infection prevention control for long-term care facilities in the context of COVID-19. However, we've realized that even with guidance uh, for IPC, if these are not implemented uh, and if uh, governments or authorities do not support long-term care facilities uh, in providing PPE, in providing additional funding for emergency response, it's really difficult to, uh, to have just a guidance and really uh, move forward with these uh, policies within long-term care facilities. Next, please. So in uh, so in July uh, we targeted uh, to target policymakers and authorities and long lo local subnational and national level uh, personnel. We uh, per, uh, we released a policy guidance, a policy brief on preventing and managing COVID-19 across long-term care services. We provided 11 policy objectives, looking into financing issues, governance issues, monitoring and surveillance issues, IPC testing. Uh, caregiver support and more, looked at the existing challenges long-term care is facing, the implications these challenges have had in the context of COVID-19, and have provided key actions that should be taken by whole-of-sector long-term care facilities and com community to mitigate these um, challenges and uh, burden, and also provided best practice examples from countries. Next, please. 
And, uh, and thus, we had provided 11 policy objectives, once again, including some of these policy objectives are uh, a matter of fact for healthcare facilities, and many countries have uh, provided this for healthcare facilities. However, long-term care has become a blind spot, and so once again, we needed to reiterate this and, uh, and emphasize these 11 policy objectives so that countries and authorities uh, involved in the COVID response could, uh, could apply this. So one is on governance, one is on uh, mobilizing adequate funding and providing long-term care uh, with funding so that they can uh, respond to the pandemic in an adequate manner, uh, employing more human resources uh, and, uh, and being able to acquire more PPE, et cetera, et cetera. Also, we uh, created a web annex, a subsequent web annex that focuses mainly just on long-term care facilities and provided key objectives and actions to prevent and manage COVID-19 within long-term care facilities. So we've emphasized nine areas, including testing, IPC, and uh, having uh, health, uh, health sector oversight, providing and mobilizing additional funding for long-term care facilities, uh, ensuring effective monitoring strategies for long-term care facilities, uh, securing staff and surge capacity, uh, providing continuity of essential services, prioritizing psychological well-being of those receiving and providing long-term care services, and ensuring a smooth transition into the recovery phase. Next, please. I won't go through uh, each and every uh, policy objective, but as we know, the important is an emphasis on IPC and uh, extensive testing. So objective 2.6 emphasizes that ensuring to ensure that infection prevention control standards are implemented and adhered to in long-term care settings. We provide once again the challenges that long-term care facilities have met, these implications during the COVID-19 as lack of mechanisms to ensure implementation of ICC guidelines, lack of training of long-term care workers on IPC measures, high staff turnover, which is impeding continuity of care and consistency of IPC measures, difficulties in fiscal distancing, and care workers uh, not being able to adequately uh, get access information on limiting transmission in the context of COVID-19. Next, please. So we provide a key actions and, uh, in, uh, and also we emphasize having an IPC focal point and lead to coordinate IPC activities, establishing uh, coordinating bodies to adjust and update IPC guidance as uh, adequate uh, and monitoring implementation of IPC and providing resources needed to implement IPC. So we are asking governments, we are asking authorities to do all of this and not just provide IPC guidance to uh, booklets, that they need to support long-term care facilities to actually achieve implementation of these important objectives. Next, please. Next. Next, please. Thank you. Uh, and next, please. Next slide. So objective 2.7 uh, emphasizes prioritizing testing. Once again, we look at the high percentage of asymptomatic cases. So we are uh, emphasizing that when we uh, that we need to ensure rigorous testing, countries to ensure that uh, facilities can ensure rigorous testing of both residents and staff, not just residents, but also staff. And when a first case is confirmed, consider a comprehensive testing strategy of all residents and staff. These comprehensive testing strategies should be developed and implementing, including those without symptoms, because of the high incidence of asymptomatic and atypical symptoms we find in, uh, in COVID cases within long-term care facilities. Next slide, please. The policy brief also uh, provides initial, uh, initial next steps after uh, the COVID pandemic. As we know that COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted fragmentation between long-term care services within healthcare systems. So we ask countries and governments to look beyond COVID-19 and really initiate steps for transforming health and long-term care systems to appropriately uh, integrate and ensure continuity of care services uh, and effective governance uh, over these services uh, by, uh, by multiple sectors. Next slide, please. So as next steps, we are currently on the final stages of developing the scientific brief uh, for analysis on the burden of COVID-19 across long-term care facilities. Also, we are modeling, modeling uh, non-pharmacologic interventions, especially IPC interventions, to see whether uh, to see look for mitigating uh, the burden of COVID-19 on long-term care facilities. We will are also on the final stages of uh, creating a facility readiness checklist uh, to respond to COVID-19 for long-term care facilities. Also, an IPC 
assessment checklist so it makes it easier to look into uh, which areas uh, we need to look into when we assess for IPC readiness as well. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Mathur and also Caitlin for uh, for being expert uh, panels for the uh, policy brief uh, creation because I think their role was mandatory and uh, essential. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jia, for comprehensive overview of what is being done. And it has been great on your part to have prepared a clear cut, precise action plan for the authorities to undertake, because there has been no ambiguity in preparing these plans. So it makes it easy for translating it into the action for the authorities. And I think we'll be having a lot many questions for you, which we'll be taking at the end of the session or so. So now I'll request Ms. Kathleen to talk to us. Caregiving is an important area. What we have found, a compassionate caregiver who is concerned about the person with adequate skill and time and resources, that only can help an older person to receive care of good quality uh, and also with dignity also. And all this would put the caregiver to stress. And, and also along with this, there are uh, other issues when the caregiving is not possible at home, then the person has to be shifted to a residential accommodation or so. So in those cases, the residential facilities and the long-term care facilities are an important component of the long-term care which we provide to them. And there also to maintain safety and dignity is an important task. I'll request Ms. Kathleen to talk to us about this. Over to you, Kathleen. Thank you. Um, yes, so I will be speaking about residential and long-term care facilities as well, but knowing that Zia would present um, some of the infection control. I'll just touch on that lightly. Uh, can I see my first slide? So I'll just go over the background and key issues, some of which have been touched on in the introduction, and then I included links for um, infection control sources, because I figured some of you listening may not be familiar with what is available. So I heard the slides will be shared later, and you can look at the sources if that's helpful for you, if you're looking for technical uh, details, but mostly I'd like to focus on issues of dignity and equity and uh, recommendations for action as well on, the, on those points. Next slide. So it is true that in global headlines, um, care homes and COVID-19 have had a lot of attention. It started maybe when um, COVID-19 hit Europe and places like Italy saw massive outbreaks with high levels of fatalities within their care homes. Um, can you click ahead as I go to the headlines. There's about four in a row. Yeah, and then um, I, a little bit, Zia pointed out the next one, which is um, about this recognition that the majority of deaths at the end of June um, were said by the World Health Organization and by the analysis by the International Care Policy Network to be accounting for, for about half of the deaths. Can you click ahead to the next two headlines? Next one. Okay, but then we saw that in Japan and Singapore and Korea, there wasn't the same level of catastrophic outbreak occurring, although it is still a very, um, a very, a population that you need to be careful with. So you can see here that in Japan, 14% of their just 1,200 deaths by the end of August were in elderly care homes compared to 40% of the 180,000 deaths in US in the same period. Um, but I, and there's this, uh, so it's not, it's not wonderful. 14% of deaths among a very small portion of the population shows that this is a high risk issue. Um, but certainly some things can be done about it as Zia spoke about. And one issue that has been highlighted is really what prioritization is the safety and protection and the dignity and the well being of older people given in policies and practice. So in Japan, there's some analysis that says that is, um, you know, unacceptable for that type of thing to occur and a lot of attention on, on addressing it. Um, next 
So in, as some, someone mentioned earlier, in Kerala and in Chennai, there have been outbreaks, but also not a lot of deaths yet. Um, next one. And then the last one is looking at um, in Nepal, a headline that talks about how old age homes are on high alert. So it hasn't maybe hit the news as an issue yet, but it's an awareness that it's a high risk population. Next slide. And the reason it's high risk is really because you have a high density of high risk population. And it does kind of depend what type of home we're talking about. Um, but if you have a long-term care facility that is providing for people with care needs, then you're having also high levels of comorbidities and advanced age and also dementia, which can have um, caused difficulties with the individual person um, being able to remember and adhere to social distancing guidelines, um, but also that need for close personal contact for many people. If you need assistance with eating or bathing or toileting, you can't maintain a, a two meter distance. Um, and questions around staff ratios and uh, whether staff are shared between facilities or between a high number of people, that's one reason why um, once COVID enters a facility, it can be quite difficult to control. Um, but it also points out that there's been weak quality management before COVID-19. And so in places where that already existed, when an outbreak comes to the town or to the facility, um, specifically, you can see that the, the precautions were not in place to provide protection and, uh, and vice versa. And then we'll talk a little bit later about some of the violence, abuse, and neglect concerns, but, um, but certainly uh, something to be concerned about. Uh, next slide. So um, in Sierra region, uh, there's been a bit of discussion about India, but I would like to say that, um, you know, of course, throughout the region, the vast majority of people with care needs live at home. If they're wealthy, they're paying for private nursing care or domestic workers to provide social care. And if not, they're providing that care by um, informal carers like family members. Um, so it's a very small portion of people that live in care facilities, and especially you don't see large numbers of people staying in high-end, expensive, um, private, uh, long-term care facilities. So what there is much more of is the social welfare shelter um, type, where the aim is shelter for able-bodied but um, economically destitute older people who are in need of food and shelter. Um, and these are provided by government, by charities, and for profits to an extent. But as I was saying, for profits not really yet as big or as uh, common a phenomenon here. Um, but there are so many unknowns because these facilities are largely not registered or regulated and they're not coordinated. So when there is, for example, COVID 19 outbreak, it's quite difficult to get out technical guidance to all of those um, administrators of residential and, and long-term care homes and old age homes uh, because, pe because the government isn't actually regulating or registering them to know who they are and where they are, how many residents they have, and if they're meeting quality standards and technical guidance. Next slide. Um, so there's a lot of uh, variability in mortality that we're seeing, and this is pointing to the unknowns that uh, Professor Mavalankar was speaking about, and I think we will have to see what emerges in the research about why there, why, what are the causes of those different um, variability. But I did want to just point out that Health Age International will also be doing a report analyzing variable COVID-19 mortality among older people in Asia Pacific um, by forms of long-term care, and we expect that to be um, out by the end of November. In fact, I think the consultant is uh, attending the session today. That's uh, Justine uh, Bloom. Next slide. So, um, so the next few slides are just some of the guidance. So these ones have mostly been talked about already, but the bottom two, and there's a third one, um, the smaller ones on this slide are from Western Pacific Region, World Health Organization. And there's like a checklist um, and some kind of practical technical guidance for, techni uh, for facilities um, on COVID-19 protection. Next slide. And Health Age International has also issued a wide variety of guidance um, covering a lot of topics, but including um, for older people themselves, 
for people with care needs who um, require support from others at home and in facilities. And there's videos for both of those as well and end of life care um, guidance as well. Next slide. And then this is the sources I was telling you that you would have available, but I did wanna point out the bottom one, which is from this website, www.ltccovid.org. That was established in about February by the International Care Policy Network and collates research and resources from governments and academic and other sources on long-term care and COVID. And it's a very good, rich um, resource for uh, anything, any questions you might have. Next slide. I think I'll skip this point because uh, Zia covered um, infection control well and move on to the next slide. So we have some more headlines. Um, this one is from Massachusetts where former nursing home leaders were charged with criminal neglect in the wake of 76 COVID deaths. Next slide, or uh, next um, headline. In Spain, the report that uh, staff who were just overwhelmed um, because of the COVID-19 outbreak were just sedating uh, residents um, en masse. Next. This is from Montreal, um, where 31 uh, uh, people died. And when there was an investigation, it was clear that people, um, there wasn't enough nursing staff to provide care and people were really being abandoned and not able to provide care for themselves. Next slide. And even in Delhi, uh, this is relatively recent, uh, August 2nd, you know, recognition. And this article also spoke about um, COVID-19 guidelines not being uh, practiced and, and that sort of thing. Next slide. So I think that in my view, you have the COVID-19 and we have some really strong technical guidance on how to protect homes from um, COVID-19 and what you should do if it enters your facility. Um, but I would argue that there is a pandemic, another pandemic that predates COVID-19, and that is um, within care homes and with people with care needs, a disregard for dignity and autonomy. Um, and I think that this is something that needs to be addressed in order to have any real impact on the well-being and of older people that are in care homes. Um, so there's questions to ask if you are a government policymaker or if you're someone who has influence over those things or if you're running a care home yourself. I think ultimately the question is, would you be happy living in that facility um, or having your parent or grandparent living in that facility? And if not, why not? If it's just about fancy equipment or, I don't know, the finest Wi-Fi access, that's one thing. But if the reason is that, you know, people are not being offered dignity in the provision of services, for example, if personal care is taking place wide open in a room with a bunch of other residents, or if, um, if staff are not properly trained or are not treating people with dignity, or if they're mocking people or abusing them physically, if, um, if residents have no decision-making power about their uh, home that they're living in, you know, what they do with their free time. Are they allowed um, to leave the property? Of course, with COVID, there's some other issues, but, but before COVID or when that's not the issue, are people kind of, I see the word inmates used a lot in, um, in South Asia to describe people living in old age homes. And, um, and I think, you know, I've visited places where, where people are not allowed to leave the property. Um, but if they're mobile and they don't have care needs, why, why is that really? And do people have, are they being included in COVID-19 decision-making, you know, um, and informed about what they need to do to keep themselves safe and the others that they live with safe? Um, and are there accountability and transparency and complaints mechanisms in place? I mean, how would uh, the government know if a facility is um, doing something that's not right? Is there, is there quality improvement going on if we don't have registration and guidelines and, um, and regulations in place. And I think there's broader issues of dignity and non-discrimination and equity as well. With these old age homes that are run for social welfare purposes, um, if, the, if they're not accepting people, generally speaking, who have care needs, it's mostly for mobile um, people, but who don't have financial resources, why not offer them ca cash transfers instead and allow them to live independently in the community? And instead to invest, um, as Dr. Arvin said, in developing facilities for people who actually need uh, 24 hour 
comp care and support for complex health needs where they can't be safely um, provided care at home or adequately have their needs met and do actually require that. Um, so I think it's a question of how, what we invest in and why and what we're willing or unwilling to allow to occur in our countries and our communities and in our care homes. Next slide. So I think that really there's the shift is needed is completely towards person-centered care that places the individual person that has care support needs um, in the driver's seat. Of course, if someone has advanced dementia, for example, there may need to have assistance with decision-making or, uh, or something, but for many people, um, decisions are taken away from them and, uh, and they're not really asked, what do you value? What's important to you? How can we support you to do that? And I think that's really crucial uh, shift to make. Next slide. So for care homes, infection control, yes, but let's also include the residents in the decision-making process and in putting those into place. Um, but in a bigger picture, let's make those shifts that need to be made so that we can actually ensure the safety and the dignity of people that are living in residential facilities and invest in developing national care systems that meet the care needs um, of the society. Uh, largely, that probably has to do with age, supporting aging in place, so a lot of support for informal carers, um, development of home and community-based care, and then also, yes, invest in developing long-term care facilities for that minority of people that really need um, nursing care. Um, and, and also just let's think about how to do that in a way that ensures that it isn't just the wealthy who have access to the care support that they need, um, or that we don't um, extend gender inequality through reliance on unpaid or poorly paid care profession roles that are mostly taken by women. Um, so let's find ways to build back better post-COVID using the COVID um, recovery process to reorient and invest in different ways. Um, I think that's the, that's the call to action. So thank you for, next slide, my thank you slide. Thank you uh, for allowing me to share today. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for highlighting very important issues of the residential care. And we all agree that uh, there needs to be done a lot for the planning of the care of the older long term care of the older people. I think we'll have a lot many questions for you at the end of the session. Uh, I'll now go move on to request Professor Sushma Bhatnagar to talk to us about the stress the carer feels, particularly while they are taking care of terminally ill. And during this period of COVID-19. As we have already mentioned that the caregiver stress is an important stress and to this, this particular entity is added. So I'll request Professor Sushma Patnagar to go ahead with her presentation. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, Professor Sushma. Can you hear uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mathu, and uh, thank you everyone for inviting me, Professor Day, uh, for, for this important forum to speak about the stress for caring terminally ill. So uh, I am working in the Cancer Center of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and uh, it has become a huge problem for us to balance the cancer patient versus COVID patient. It, it is becoming a huge problem and how this problem is grappling us and how we are trying to sort it out. This is what I'm going to speak in the next few slides. So this is my first slide that we all know that ongoing coronavirus disease, COVID-19 has swept all over the world as well as India. It has become the biggest health crisis and posing a great pressure on healthcare resources. And this is the are seeing the premier institute of the country is finding difficult in terms of manpower and uh, human resources. Balancing COVID and non-COVID work, COVID work is becoming challenging, challenge, challenging, especially when uh, we see the cancer patient because cancer patient needs care, immediate care, but it is becoming difficult to balance this. It causes big stress on healthcare resource and healthcare worker. So 
we i am going to highlight how we are trying to make a balance between cancer patients and non cancer and covid patients next slide please next slide so this is a uh, yesterday's uh, times of india cutting and you must all must have seen this is from india then uh, this was a very important uh, uh, important uh, cut uh, important message which uh, times of india has given that covid deaths are 1 million but 15 diseases kills more than more than this every year means every year more than these this number of patients they die because of 15 important diseases and in the in this cancer is number 2 above after cardiovascular disease so we all know that non communicable diseases are the are the important uh, killer in the in this country and cancer is number 2 so it is very important that although we are in and we have to do that because it's a growing healthcare crisis but simultaneously, it is also important that the people, those who cannot, who can be, who can be prevented death, who can be, we can, we can do something for the other patient, those who are suffering with non-communicable chronic disease. I think we have to do, and this is what uh, uh, aims, what it aims planning that I will tell you in subsequent slide. Next slide, please. So, uh, first of all, uh, next slide, please. So first of all, whenever a patient is coming, it is uh, although there is a problem that uh, we want to see the patient, but simultaneously there is a huge pressure on the healthcare uh, mind that they may get infected, and the healthcare or manpower uh, should not be uh, should not be crippled by getting infected, and we should not be short of manpower. So what we have done first thing which we have done uh, is to uh, make made a lot of posters that how we can prevent how we can protect ourselves so protecting healthcare personnel is the most topmost priority when we want to treat covid 19 as well as non covid patients those who are unnecessary time so so first of all we have a lot of infection control programs was very robust and we uh, infection control uh, team has given a lot of training to all the healthcare workers including doctors, nurses, paramedicals, paramedics, uh, security personnel, sanitation personnel, everybody was getting, everybody got trained. Very rigorous training was ha happened just to how to protect themselves. Second thing which we have done in cancer center, sorry, I think, uh, second thing which we have done in cancer center is uh, as soon as patient enters in the cancer hospital, we have not stopped them to enter, but we have started screening them. Initially, if somebody was somebody would have come to cancer center in Ames, they will they will find that it is it is same as like a uh, as a vegetable market or a railway station. It was it is so crowded, but now we crowd is there definitely because we cannot uh, control the crowd. Crowd is there, but we are require we are advising the crowd that to keep the safe distancing and the patient and relative those who will enter inside the building we screen them very very seriously that they should not have fever they should not have influenza like symptoms they should be genuinely coming because you know in india it is a nature that if a patient is coming four people are coming just uh, relatives are coming with the patient and they really increase the crowd so we have created a system that all the patients, those who will enter in the hospital, inside the building, they will be screened thoroughly. Second, next slide, please. Next thing which we have done that, uh, as I'm the uh, looking after the Department of Palliative Medicine, and we once the patient has entered and he has gone to oncologist, various oncologists, and oncologist uh, have, has advised something, but we also know that uh, patient in India, most of the patients, they present in advanced stage. Otherwise also, no, if there is no COVID, then also 70 to 80% of patients, they present in advanced stage of because of various issues, like of screening facility, or if there is a screening facility, it's a big stigma, people don't come forward. And finally, they present in a very, very advanced stage. So because of the advanced stage, most of the patients, they are they need some kind of a care that, that is, and they are in 
and and somehow with the in last six months those patients those who were curable they also be, have to gone into advanced stage so the the chunk of the patient the major majority of the patients are in the advanced stage and they need care so what we have done throughout the lockdown from the march onwards the whole country was closed but we have not stopped palliative medicine department so we were continuously seeing the uh, patients in palliative medicine department so that patient those who are in advanced stage of the disease and they were they are having some kind of symptoms intractable symptoms means they are stressed up with the covid 19 but they are also dying because of the intractable pain intractable breathlessness or intractable symptoms we continued to see all those patients and this is the number of the patients which we have seen in last six months almost 5943 patients we have seen out of this uh, although new registration were only 250 but rest all the follow-up patients so we have never stopped our follow-up patients we have never stopped seeing patients new patients so we continue to see advanced stage cancer patients so i think at least i can assure and i can confidently say the patient has not suffered those who were registered in I, in uh, cancer center of aims and having pain and require, requiring palliative medicine facilities so we have provided them palliative medicine facilities these are the photographs of opd and different different wards next please so uh, this is again a very important uh, healthcare reforms has happened i think i can say that all over the world telemedicine telemedicine we were we knew that uh, there is something called we can talk to the patient on phone we can do video calling we can we can consult patients and but you know before covid 19 we were not it was a underutilized resource so after covid 19 we have realized that it's such a wonderful resource which we can really use for our patients and i can say with the current situation and the the future if we uh, we see or we visualize this will uh, this type of uh, situation may go for a long time maybe if there will be no no peak but definitely patients will keep coming and telemedicine is according to me will be the way forward for next one to two years and in this covid era we have really utilized this resource extensively and this is the uh, the the patients number of patients with we, which we have seen through telemedicine almost more than uh, i think now this figure is two months old so almost a thousand patients we have seen through telemedicine and we have provided through telemedicine them pain and symptom management we have also provided them that if patient is need some medication we have provided them uh, patient wanted to know about the information regarding chemotherapy or radiotherapy or any oncology therapy with this we have given on online we have also provided end of life care or palliative care counseling means a patient who is terminally dying whose life expectancy or is only for few few hours or few days and patients relatives they are very very apprehensive they just wanted to they wanted to run from one hospital to other hospital we have counseled them on phone we have counseled them on video calling video chats that now this is the situation given them the realistic picture given them the honest information and tried them to take care of the patient at home as far as possible so we have also provided end of life care through telemedicine and finally few of our patients those those were really really feeling guilty they were feeling quite sick that we have not we could not take care of my patient because of covid we, i could not take off my take to uh, my patient to any other hospital so we have also provided bereavement care so through telemedicine you can see that we have really utilized this resource judiciously and extensively but so for almost all the symptoms all the purposes we have used telemedicine and i think we have to keep using this resource for next few years and maybe one or two years this will continue so i think my recommendation is that telemedicine should be should be supported and should be given to as many patients as possible when it is definitely when a physical presence of patient is required in many of the times 
as for a, for example if a new patient is coming and we have to prescribe opioid we wanted to see patients and we have never prescribed opioids on phone or on telephone we have always called patient and given medication after seeing the patient and after realizing the need so telemedicine is the is the the way and it's going to be the way forward for in for next few years next slide please next slide so uh, this is a this is a slide which says that intractable pain and symptom needs immediate care so when a patient is suffering with cancer we all know they they are going in advanced stage because most of the time i think it has suffered cancer care is cure or care is suffered drastically in covid era and patients are going towards the advanced stage and when patient is going towards the advanced stage because of the cancer either cancer is progressing or cancer is infiltrating the the nearby structure or nerves patients they present in intractable pain and they need a center management and immediate care so we have never stopped this and we have made a standard operating procedure for how to take care of these patients and this is there on the aims website all these our charts are there on the aims website so approximately almost uh, again this figure is of two months old 319 patients we have admission which we have admitted in emergency when patient is in intractable pain or breathless breathlessness or some kind of a symptom which we have to treat immediately so and almost all the patients 90 patients we did analgesic hydration and put some kind of a procedure like a cytic tapping or pleural tapping and in 46 of patients we did symptom management so uh, so we you can see that even with the covid 19 uh, situation i requested my residents that not a single patient who needs this kind of palliative medicine care or palliative care or patient is in intractable symptom should not be deprived of care so they used to use all sorts of protection if patient is so what we have made the protocol this this is not you won't be able to see in the chart but what we have made the protocol as soon as patient is coming with an emergency and the symptoms is if, if we think that patient need to be admitted for the symptom management or for the pain management we admit the patient we see that we do the covid testing uh, simultaneously with using all the protective measures we start treating the pain management we start giving the center management and once the covid report comes accordingly we decide if patient is positive then we shift the, the patient to the covid area or if it is negative we continue to take care but meantime till the time reports come i think it is very mandatory for all the residents and nursing staff and health care workers to completely take care of the protective equipment they used to you have to have a face shield mask gown cover cover all everything they use to they are taking care of themselves so this is the way we have taken care of patients with intractable pain and symptoms when they required in cancer patients next slide please so uh, this is a very uh, very slide which i think almost everybody must be knowing this a very familiar slide that palliative care is the care which we should provide throughout the illness right from the beginning similarly in covid era i can say that after seeing that uh, covid patients as well as non covid patients because in aims uh, our department especially is looking after the whole of a covid center with other departments almost 15 to 20 departments but our department is taking the lead plus we are also seeing the cancer patient and what i have realized whether it is covid patients or a cancer patient patient needs continuum palliative care throughout the throughout the disease and it it should be integrated integrated right from the beginning so this is very important right from the beginning whether covid or non covid patient patient needs honest information and realistic hope about the disease and we have uh, this is our responsibility to provide this next slide please ma'am uh, we'll have to sum up in two minutes now okay so this is what the terminally patient needs what need honest information realistic hope freedom from pain and suffering and he wants sympathy not sympathy and he wants approachable expert next slide please so this is uh, the positive outcome 
outcome of integration of palliative care that if we will do this they will be there will be better patient and doctor relationship next slide please so this is what we have done and uh, uh, we keep saying we keep worrying about the patient but we have done a study that what are the concern of healthcare professional what are the stress of healthcare professional when they are looking after the covid 19 patient and what we have found that almost 72 percent remain worried that they should they will get infected and their family members will get infected they are worried that there is a daily activity is disrupting they are coping with reassurance appreciation from seniors they are coping with the connectedness with family and friends they feel pride when they do take care of covid patients and they are very very they are definitely liking the team approach and proper duty hours and the breaks they are liking so the, the, definitely a reassurance and appreciation really makes a lot of difference for residents and the healthcare staff next slide please so uh, this is the uh, this is uh, the number of patients which we have seen in our covid area almost i have shown you the cancer patients number in in the department but this is also the number of covid area almost 4000 today it has almost reached to 2000 4600 and almost uh, the 85 patients today we have till today we have seen uh, 200 of icu care uh, given icu care next next slide please next so this is my last slide that uh, as we see that covid is important but non-covid is all and we must definitely acknowledge the the care which they are providing resident and uh, staff members medical health care workers and we should sell you to our heroes next slide please next slide this is a true truly a last slide that whether patient is in terminal stage or in the covid stage Humanity is a wonder drug. We should not forget humanity. We should continue to use humanity. It is 100%, it has a 100% relief. There is no overdose, there is no underdose, and it provides the total concept of total care, which is vital in COVID patient, as well as a patient who is suffering with terminal illness, and he's in the terminal stage of the disease. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Professor Sushma Patnagar for highlighting the stress which the healthcare workers they feel while taking care of these uh, serious patients. Uh, now we have uh, finished with the presentation of our panelists. We will have a sh short time for question answers. So I'll, Kathleen, I'd like to ask you something which has been uh, uh, asked by Dr. Narayan Kang from Gujarat. That there is a lot of anxiety, depression, and other mental illnesses among senior citizens during COVID-19. And we may need to step up psychosocial care and mental health support to elderly. So please share any good practice across the world for improving access to mental health care for the elderly. So, yeah, so thank Kathleen, you for the question. It's, a very, have, it's a very important um, issue. Um, I would say that right from the start, World Health Organization did put out some pretty good guidance in general and some support through um, like technical guidance, but also like their online app had places for mental health kind of support. But of course, um, it's it more, more than that, it has been developed since then. Um, I would say also just as just a few resources. HealthAge International does also on that list of guidance that I have, have something on psychosocial support for older people. And in there, we talk about some of the practical things that are being done around the world, um, specifically things like helplines um, and like distance support. So for example, within care homes, if you cut off connection to visitors um, in terms of physical distancing, can you use uh, smartphones or tablets or some other way to or through the window to allow there to be continued connection with loved ones and friends. Um, JAGES, which is the Japanese uh, Ger Aging and Gerontological Society Survey, I think I got that right, they have some really good robust research on the importance of um, psychosocial support and also social isolation. And they talk about things like community solidarity um, and participation in community groups being very um, 
important. And of course, with physical distancing, there are still ways to do that. And even in India, there's quite a lot of helplines that have been established at state level, I think, or even maybe lower levels. So that type of stuff is useful. I always keep in mind, um, there's kind of two things that I use to think about this. One is there's the mental health supports for people who have kind of more serious mental health needs and they need access to clinical support as well. And that's a whole other area of health systems that is usually underdeveloped and under-resourced. So I would say that is important. And then there's the general psychosocial support needs, um, which is something that we can all do help help each other in supporting. And when I think about that one, I just think about two pieces of evidence on this from um, Dr. Holt Lundstadt's research. And that is that people need um, a certain number of positive interactions in the day. And they also need at least one relationship where they can share their hopes and dreams and fears, like an intimate friendship. So I think that whatever we do, we need to keep those things in mind, those kind of areas. Um, but yeah, I would suggest looking into some of those guidance notes. Thank you, thank you very much. I have one question for Dr. Jia. That how do you visualize long-term care in post-COVID era? Uh, for post-COVID era, we, uh, we think that home-based long-term care will be emphasized more and more. As we know, uh, facility-based long-term care is also important, but in terms of cost, effectiveness in, in terms of aging in place, uh, in terms of uh, being, able to, being able to stay in a place where you are familiar with. And so home-based services and maybe community-based services will be uh, a base that will be, um, will be promoted even more and more after uh, the COVID era. Also, uh, uh, strong legislation and health sector oversight over long-term care facilities will also be something that will be looked into uh, post-COVID era. Uh, WHO will move uh, together with our regions to move forward uh, aging in place, home-based care. And I think Dr. Mathur, you're also an advocate of this, so we will have you on board to move this forward after the COVID pandemic, hopefully quickly as possible. Thank you. Because in Southeast Asia, this remains the most important area for the long-term care. And we'll have to work for this particular cause. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. So good. Definitely. Um, Professor Bhatnagar, uh, just thank you for uh, giving an, it's, um, the overview of the stress of the healthcare workers. Uh, what have you been doing to keep your moral up of all your staff and residents? Uh, I think uh, the constant meetings, be talking to them, and uh, I think breaks appreciation uh, because it is a stressful time. People are working non-stop. I think for since last six months they are working in cancer and non-cancer both the places. But uh, their appreciation, they're talking to them, solving their issues, and giving them the assurity that uh, that they are protected. They are precious for us. If anything will, anything is going to happen, we are going to there. And we have proved it. One or two residents were positive, and we took them. We took their utmost care. So I think uh, giving them full protection and confidence give them boosting. Plus, when they are posted, they are in the uh, in a place where it is like a resort. So all the their infrastructure, their logistics, they are taken care of. So they don't have to worry that they have to go home, they have to cook food or something like this. Everything is taken care over there. I think this is the way. Plus, I think confidence with the with the seniors, I think that makes a lot of difference that uh, we are there with them in their fight and we are also fighting with them uh, with the with the serious healthcare crisis and we will take care of them in something is there, something is going to, something is, something unto what happens. So this gives them confidence and uh, I think breaks makes a lot of difference and appreciation this makes a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much for all, all this. I, we had a great uh, discussion today about very important issue of long-term care, which is uh, going to be emphasized in coming years and realized by all, everybody because uh, it is said by Madam Rosalind Carter, that 
there are only four types of people in world the one who received care one who delivers care third is one who would be given care and fourth is one who would be needing care that's all so everybody on earth would be at one stage or other would experiencing the issue of care long term care and there there is a need to establish a system which could support everyone and as we have been discussing earlier also that it is not investment it is long term care system is that will have its own dividends to help this economy also and we need to integrate both health and social sector i thank all the distinguished panelists for their excellent presentation and enlightenment which they have given and i hope we will continue to have such discussions in the future also i hand over to madam dr raina please thank you very much uh, uh, dr arvind mathur for moderating this session uh, uh, it is uh, i understand there are two uh, things which i like to say that uh, all these presentations will be shared uh, by iaph with all the present uh, uh, people and i uh, understand that we have the permission of the panelists to share these pdf files with uh, all the participants there were there, there were about 220 uh, people linked uh, to this uh, webinar and then uh, uh, the recording of this webinar also will be put on iaph site and the information will be shared by them so you'll have the recording you'll have the presentations uh, uh, as well so thank you very much uh, dr mathur uh, for coordinating and moderating this uh, session uh, i'll also like to uh, thank uh, dr uh, zihan my colleague from geneva uh, she is we always call her the mother of long term care uh, you know wonderful uh, you know work which has been done especially the guidelines which have come out uh and dr catlin uh, who is really uh, made me your uh, presentation made me very very emotional especially when we talk of abuse neglect uh so i see that uh, respect and dignity is so very important and dr uh, bhatnagar from aims uh, i think uh, kudos to your uh, team who are doing such wonderful work uh, that they have not stopped seeing the patients and uh, have started to really look into other alternate uh, uh, innovative approaches to reach out uh, to them so i i see that uh, uh, for those who are still connected i see a lot of people are still connected with us on this uh, uh, webinar important webinar uh, we all of us who are connected on this webinar uh, one time or the other in our life have either given long term care or have seen our parents give long term care to our grandparents uh, i personally have gone through it very recently uh, for my mother and my mother in law uh, both and uh, believe in me uh, you know even giving them a side uh, you know because your backs are gone you yourself are old so it becomes so very difficult and dr arvind mathur and me we have been sharing a lot of Uh, experiences unfortunately i lost uh, both of them but i think uh, uh, this is something which uh, to my mind is a very very important uh, issue uh, especially during the uh, covid times uh, i'll bring home uh, three or four key messages uh, which i would like everyone to take uh, away from this webinar uh, one is that uh, uh, during uh, long term care facilities uh by definition uh, are uh, different in different countries uh, it ranges from uh, you know having sick people put into nursing homes for long term care where the families are not able to look after them but they are sick and they require bedridden or bedside care uh second is that those who are uh, who's who do not have children or who do not have anyone to look after them or kids are not able to keep them because of any other social reason they put them in old age homes and that is what dr uh, dilip mablankar also talked about uh, dr katlin talked about so i think uh, that's another uh, group where they are healthy they are mobile but then they do not have a home to stay 
so they are not with morbidities always but then of course with age you do develop morbidities so i think when we talk of long term care facilities uh, we need to look into the definitions uh, of these long term care facilities whether these are old age homes with healthier relatively healthier uh, populations or these are and some are even hospices you know where the uh, for palliative or uh, for palliative care, there are certain uh, facilities for long-term care, which is much more there in the uh, you know developed world compared to the developing world. And hence, you see many more deaths because these are nursing homes, these are hospices. They they are all put together as uh, this. So uh, I think we need to be uh, very very uh, uh, careful when we talk of long-term care facilities that uh, uh, what are we really uh, talking about uh, uh, exactly depending upon the uh, structures which are available uh, in developed and developed developing countries the second uh, you know message which i get is uh, the guidelines which are evidence based guidelines are available from who on uh, ipc whether we call it ipc guidelines or we talk of uh, provision of services and I think uh, Dr. Zihan's uh, presentation uh, very well highlighted that we have these guidelines available, but countries need to adapt. And believe in me, many of the countries won't even know that these guidelines exist. So we have created uh, a SharePoint for WHO staff, uh, especially our WHO country office colleagues as well, where we put uh, uh, guidelines uh, which have been developed by WHO in our area of work, which is the whole of RMCH, Healthy Aging, Violence Against Women, and so on. And uh, also what countries have developed. So we have country-wise folders, what countries are developing. And third, what partners have developed. So uh, uh, Kathleen, your uh, list which you have given will be accessing and will be adding it you know, to, to that list so that this is accessible. So once our WHO country office staff is able to access this SharePoint, they can share quickly with the countries and advocate so I think having a policy dialogue with the uh, countries and the ministries and the governments uh, is extremely important for us to make sure that these are really adopted and adapted at the country level. So these, you know, that's a good thing that we are emerging. There's so much of resource from HelpAge, from uh, you know uh, WHO and other partners. Uh, I'm sure uh, as well. The third message uh, I think I uh understand that uh, we are talking of disruption because the indirect we are talking of direct and indirect impact of covid 19 on older population direct impact is very clear you know you get covid you die but indirect impact is something which i think uh, was mentioned by dr bhatnagar very nicely that you uh you know you see that there are about uh 15 uh, uh, other uh, diseases uh, which kill and cardiovascular disease and cancer top the list. So these old people who are suffering from non-communicable disease, I know during the lockdown period, they could not get their medicine, their hypertension, uh, you know, their blood pressure increased and many of them died because of uh, brain hemorrhage. Many of them died because of the heart attacks and no facility was ready to admit them because they, they have not tested for COVID. And you have not tested for COVID, it takes you one day to get the results of uh, a COVID uh, test. So I saw, you know, in our vicinity, in near and dear ones, with friends, so many people with their old parents running around from one facility to the other to get uh, a service which they required, which was non-COVID service. So I, I see that Disruption of essential health services is something which we need to really focus on. And for this, we have, uh, 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 along with the, uh, Dr. Kathleen knows about it, uh, and headquarters has given us wonderful comments. We are mapping the disruption of services in 11 countries of our region for age, older persons. Uh, we have done that for sexual reproductive maternal newborn child health. Uh, but then now we are doing it for older people, that how much is the disruption in services uh, at, at the country level? So I think that will be very, very useful information. So essential health services should not be disrupted. 
So we have to make sure that we make we we get these. And I think whether it's a long-term care facility or it is home-based long-term care or it is a facility-based or community-based long-term care, we need to really have access to services. Otherwise, everybody feels so helpless. And the indirect impact of COVID is going to lead to a much higher uh, death toll than direct impact of COVID uh, on, and on our older people. So that's my third and my last, uh, uh, you know, thing is, uh, I, I would say message, which really uh, is very close to my heart, is respect and dignity. And we have started talking about respectful, even respectful maternity care. Because the kind of, uh, the way our health workers have been trained, the way our healthcare providers have been trained, uh, I think providing respect to our patients uh, is, is extremely important. We need to really re start in letting them imbibe this in their heart and in their behavior and make it a habit to really respect your patients, respect your people who come to you uh, and who are in really need. And that's something uh, Dr. Sushma and Dr. Caitlin, you both talked about respect and dignity. Uh, I think we are talking, we are also seeing a lot of violence against uh, uh, providers, but there is a lot of violence against uh, the patients uh, in, in facilities and in hospitals as well. So we have started talking and I, I was wondering, as WHO, now we are talking of respectful maternity care. And I would say, let's start talking about respectful long-term care and let them live with dignity and die with dignity. And that brings me to your Dr. Uh, Sushma, your last point, humanity is the wonder drug. And I think, uh, you know, these are the people, uh, our old people, older persons and our elders in our families have given us values. And I think uh, uh, humanity is something which, uh, is, uh, which, which gets into you and your value system, your behavior as a result of what you get from your uh, elders uh, at home. And I think uh, being human, uh, you, you just don't need to go through academic books. Uh, you know, some people I, I know were saying that, why don't we put this uh, a chapter in uh, medical curriculum and nursing curriculum and midwifery curriculum on respect and uh, dignity and respectful care and dignified care and so on. I said, why? This is something which we get. You know, uh, as a, as human beings, we may be doctors, we may be nurses, we may be anything, uh, but we are first human beings. And I think that's something which we need to really imbibe in our next generations. And I'm very happy, Dr. Sushma, you're looking after your healthcare providers because respect and dignity flows both sides. You have to, as seniors, make sure that your people who are your heroes and COVID warriors are well looked after. Their families are well looked after, but at the same time, we also have to make sure that they provide the respectful and dignity, uh, di dignified care to older people. And I think uh, that is something which uh, brings us uh, to the last point, uh, telemedicine and teleconsultations. And I see that uh, that is the new normal. Believe in me, uh, we wouldn't have been resorted to these webinars. We would have had our meeting together. Uh, many of our meetings are pending. Uh, we plan regional meeting on, uh, uh, you know, our uh, aging expert group, which is pending. We planned another meeting on integrated care of older people, uh, which was there last year, but then we wanted to do one more this year. All, everything, all plans shattered. But then we have resorted to new normal, and the new normal is that you have to have virtual meetings. So there are so many trainings, so many capacity building exercises, trainings which we are doing through virtual uh, means. So that's our new normal. So I think let's see uh, how can we create mechanisms for older persons living in long-term care uh, facilities to be able to have access to us, you know, they, don't, they may not be having phones, they may not be having internet, they may not be having any other means to reach out to us. So how can we uh, look at these old age homes or long-term facilities where they can be connected 
and there can be some programs for them uh, tomorrow. I would like to announce that tomorrow is uh, UN International Day of Older People. Uh, I was planning to shift this webinar to tomorrow uh, so that uh, you know uh, we, we really have this as an event. But then I saw that all of us are very, very tied up with lots of events which are happening uh, tomorrow. So uh, I, I would say uh, tomorrow we'll be having our ritual directors uh, a message for the staff. Uh, we'll also be having media statement. We'll have some social uh, media also. And at headquarter level, there are three events. Uh, so we can share that uh, with everyone. Please do join these events to mark our respect uh, for older persons. And uh, why I'm saying so, because we are uh, ourselves in the same category, many of us who are <laughs> on this uh, panel and those who are also connected uh, as participants. Uh, so please do join and let's celebrate uh, age is a number. This is the time for us to really celebrate uh, uh, our, uh, you know, uh, healthy aging and how do we remain intact. And hopefully, I think the four categories, Dr. Arvind Mathur, you defined, uh, I think each one of us is at one or the other stage. And with these words, I'd like to thank uh, uh, all of our panelists and uh, Dr. Mathur for moderating this session so well, and Professor Dilip Pomablankar uh, for uh, you know, being with us uh, and, and collaborating and to Professor Dilip Mavlankar's team who has done this and they've become so professional in organizing these uh, webinars. Uh, I was a little apprehensive. What is this go to webinar? But then I see that this is so it works so well. And uh, my special thanks to Kalpna and my team, Dr. Meera Upadhyay and uh, Mr. Amit Sood, who works behind the scenes with the with this team. Uh, to really uh, uh, make sure that these webinars uh, go on well. Uh, stay happy, stay safe, and hopefully, I think let's continue to give our best to uh, the people who have given their bit already best to the society, but then they are old now, but then let's have our uh, attention uh, uh, onto them. And COVID is a wonderful, in a, in a way, is an opportunity for us to really bring our focus on older people because this is the time when older people are getting affected more and dying more and this is the time we can really have policy dialogues with the countries to have legislation to have more resources resource investments and so on thank you very much and thanks everyone have a nice uh, uh, day and evening wherever you are and thank you to the panelists and the moderator and our collaborator thank you bye bye Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All well with you, with everyone at home? Everyone. Hello. Okay. Yeah, all well, I think.